Hi all, thanks for joining. Uh, we'll give a minute for others to join and then kick off. Right, let's get started, Santosh. Yeah, sure, go ahead, Dimash. So, very good evening to everyone. Welcome to the Ireland chapter of PMI. Please be informed this session is being recorded. And I'm Yuvraj, one of the key volunteers in Ireland chapter of PMI, and I'll be your host today. I'm delighted to welcome Declan to lead today's webinar on a very interesting topic, AI in project management. Welcome, Declan. And Thank you very much. Let's wait to hear from Declan on, you know, some of the very key and interesting topics in AI, like AI in project management, history of AI and the related topics, machine learning, vendors, ethics, implications for profession, and, you know, the topics around it, yeah. I'm really keen to hear from Declan on these topics, and I'm sure you as well. And if you have any questions in the meanwhile, please comment in the chat box, and you know we will consolidate and pick the questions at the end of the session. And now I request Paramita to introduce Declan. Paramita is an expert project and program management professional and a volunteer in Ireland chapter of PMI. Paramita will take this session forward. Over to you, Paramita. Thanks, thanks, Yuvraj. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Parumita, volunteer from PMI Ireland chapter. I would like to welcome Declan Foster, our esteemed speaker today for the webinar on artificial intelligence in project management. It's really a very, very interesting topic. And he is an industry leader in change management and project delivery. He's provided consulting services to clients globally and is ranked in the top 10 global thought leaders in project management. He's always keen to learn about different industries, and he has worked in diverse organizations, including banks, not-for-profits, public transport, and airlines. Declan recently returned to his hometown of Dublin, where he occasionally admits to missing the Australian sunshine. He is the founder of Martello Change Consulting, providing change management and project delivery services to clients globally. He has written articles for leading technology websites, is a regular and active contributor on LinkedIn. Declan believes in lifelong learning and has recently studied behavioral economics and received an honors degree in artificial intelligence. He is co-author of Humology, How to Put Humans Back at the Heart of Technology. This book is a call to action to build tools that minimize the disruption to humanity without, without, without impe, impe, impeding technological progress. Welcome, Declan, and Declan, and over to you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Paramita, for that very uh, warm welcome. And uh, good evening, or good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, I'm very excited to be here uh, with the Project Management Institute tonight uh, to present on a subject which is really close to my heart, artificial intelligence and uh, project management. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. So it seems that uh, you can't open um, a newspaper lately uh, or even a news website, you know, without uh, reading a headline, uh, a new headline about uh, artificial intelligence. So whether it's the new text to image technology producing uh, art or even uh, magazine covers like we'd see there for The Economist and uh, Cosmopolitan magazine, or whether it's Elon Musk uh, unveiling his uh, unveiling his um, not too impressive new robots, um, or whether it's uh, the Google whistleblower um, claiming the, that Google's uh, large language model Lambda uh, had become sentient. Um, and again, we have those recurring headlines of the bias in AI systems. Um, whether that be in recruitment systems or in uh, loan application systems, and we constantly see headlines uh, around that. So it's a really important topic for everyone to be aware of, but I think especially um, for us in the project management uh, profession. So this evening, um, what I'd like to cover is maybe 
clarify what is artificial intelligence, talk briefly about uh, the history of artificial intelligence and talk around machine learning, which is a component of artificial intelligence. And I'll explain that uh, in uh, the session and why it's particularly relevant um, to project managers. We're going to look at some of the vendors who are operating in this space um, and the use cases applicable uh, for project management. I want to touch on uh, ethics in, in artificial intelligence as well. And then I want to uh, talk about the implication, implications um, for our profession. Um, and hopefully then at the, at, by the end of the session, we'll, we will leave enough time uh, to touch on uh, your questions. And if you do have any uh, questions, you can pop them uh, in the chat uh, as we go through the session and the team will be, be will be monitoring them throughout the, the session. So what is artificial intelligence? Well, I define um, artificial intelligence as machines acting to mimic uh, human cognition uh, to solve problems. Now, artificial intelligence and particularly machine learning have made uh, huge strides in recent years. And that's really due to the availability of, uh, first of all, increased computing power, including uh, GPUs. Then the exponential rise uh, in the availability of big data and also the development of uh, new algorithms. So that's why I guess AI is so important at the moment and, and I guess why it's in the headlines and why it's really making uh, fantastic strides in recent years. So let's just spend a moment to talk about some of the history of AI. Now, this isn't meant to be a very comprehensive or exhaustive history of everything that's happened uh, within artificial intelligence, but it's interesting just to uh, uh, take a look at that. So, I mean, we could start, I guess, in 1950, and we could look at uh, Alan Turing when he produced his paper, um, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Um, some of you uh, may have heard of Alan uh, Turing before. He is a, a very uh, uh, famous uh, a British uh, academic and scientist, um, and he actually contributed to the cracking of the en Enigma code in the Second World War. Um, he also created uh, uh, the Turing test, um, and this is the, the test or the benchmark that's still used today, and it's a, a method of inquiry in AI you know, to determine whether a computer is capable of thinking like a, a human, be human being. So you'll often hear people referring to the Turing test when we talk about chatbots or artificial intelligence. Then we go on to 1966, where uh, MIT developed uh, ELISA, um, the, first, uh, the first ever chatbot. We can move ahead to 1986, and in, uh, in Germany, the University of Munich, they created the first uh, autonomous cars. In 1997, Garry Kasparov was beaten uh, in chess by ID, IBM's uh, Deep Blue, which was the first time that I think re really the, the popular press uh, started to think about the possibilities of, of artificial intelligence. Fast forward to 2004, and we probably all remember seeing the pictures of NASA's rovers uh, autonomously navigating uh, the surface of, of Mars. Uh, IBM always have a, a huge part to play in the development of artificial intelligence. And in 2011, uh, their, uh, their, their AI system, uh, IBM Watson, it won the, the TV game show Jeopardy. Uh, 2016, uh, we had Google's AlphaGo um, artificial intelligence system uh, uh, beats the Go master uh, uh, Lee Sedol. Lee, uh, Lee now that was a really significant achievement because for years, uh, people had thought there's no way that an artificial intelligence uh, system will be able, uh, be able to, pray, uh, to play uh, the game of Go successfully. Um, it's a, a strategy game that was developed in, in China and it's you know, vastly more complex than chess. Um, in 2020, we saw uh, OpenAI release their GP3 language model. Um, and this is probably one of the things that really got me fascinated in, uh, fascinated in artificial intelligence. 
because GP, uh, GPT-3 and other similar lar large language models, they're actually capable of writing or generating, you know, poetry, uh, blog posts and uh, content, and they can even now write computer code. Uh, coming forward to this year, and again, Open uh, AI, they released uh, Adali, which is uh, an AI text to image generator. And that's the system, the AI uh, system um, that produced those magazine covers that we saw earlier uh, uh, for The Economist and uh, uh, Cosmopolitan magazine. Um, and there's even recently uh, somebody submitted uh, a piece of artwork that was generated uh, by one of these text to image generators into an art competition and they actually actually won. So I think what we could see from that is there have been gaps in the the progression of the history of AI. Sometimes you might hear people referring to the AI winters, but what I hope I've shown here is that the progress is accelerating in recent years and will continue to accelerate. And I guess, you know, let's see what happens next in the remainder of 2022 and 2023 uh, and beyond. So let's have a, we're going to really focus on uh, machine learning in tonight's uh, session because it's really the, the most relevant uh, aspect um, to project management folk. And I hope you, uh, you'll agree with that by the end of today's, uh, today's session. So if we look at a hierarchy, we can start at artificial intelligence, which includes machine learning. And it also includes things like computer vision and NLP or, or natural language processing. And then we move down into machine learning, which we, we'll look at today. And then we have a component within machine learning called deep learning, which you probably would have heard of before. Um, or you may have heard of the term artificial uh, neural networks, and we'll look at that uh, in tonight's session as well. So before we uh, drill down into three examples or three approaches um, for machine learning, I want to just explain uh, how machine learning was a, a paradigm shift in, in computing. So if we start off and look at a traditional approach to computing, we have uh, on the left hand side here, we have a program and we have data that's fed into a computer and then we get a result or an output. So you have a program like Excel. And you bring your data along, you feed that in, you know, your your your, uh, uh, your financial statistics. So you work that through the computer, through the program, and you get an output. Or it might be, a, let's say, a payroll program, and you have your data, you have your timesheets. You feed that through the computer and you get an output or result you want. You know, for the payroll application, it might be the net pay, etc. So machine learning kind of you know, turn that on its head a little bit, because what we actually do in machine learning. Yes, we have the data. And machine learning needs lots of data, and we'll talk about that as well, I think tonight. But we also have the results, so we have labeled data. So we say, for example, we're trying to come up with a model that predicts house prices. So we've got a lots of data and statistics we can about particular sales um, uh, of houses. And then we have the result, we have the prices of that, that uh, the houses were sold for. We feed that into our computer and the machine learning then creates the program or the model. So it says based on the information that you've given me, here's a model that we can now use to predict uh, in this example, house prices going forward. So it's a real shift, but it, the key thing there is that we need data. And this then starts to present one of the problems or one of the challenges, let's say, for um, the project management profession. So where do we get this data from? And we do need, we tend to need a lot of, a lot of data from machine learning. So we're going to see that we need a lot of uh, historical data. And we're going to talk about that as well when we touch on um, the implications for the, for the profession and the implications for capturing data so we can start to feed into these uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. There's also a lot of talk lately about um, synthetic data, about options for actually generating or creating artificial data or synthetic data, which can then um, feed these algorithms. 
So that's how machine learning works. And I'm actually going to take you through uh, three approaches or components of machine learning. Uh, linear regression, logistic regression, and something called clustering. I'm going to explain them. And I'm also going to explain how they're relevant to the project management uh, profession or how they can be applied uh, in projects. So the first example we'll look at is uh, a linear regression. So I touched on this uh, example of a house price predictor, and that's the classic example that people uh, use when they're starting to uh, learn to, to program or uh, artificial intelligence or start to understand um, uh, machine learning applications. So what we're trying to do here is predict a uh, continuous value Y, which is the house price. And we're feeding in uh, a feature or multiple features. And this is it. Uh, and we're trying to keep this example quite simplistic, um, which we will for the other examples tonight. You can see on the X axis there, we're just giving it one feature. In reality, you'd have a lot more features than that. Um, you know, if uh, I, I like to, to say that, you know, if you can figure something out on the back of an envelope or even in an advanced spreadsheet, you probably don't need a machine learning algorithm. So this is where you, you have multiple features. And um, so we, we, we're using the size and square feet, but it might be the number of bathrooms or it might be the proximity to public transport or the proximity to uh, good schools as well it might be a factor and you, you build that all in. So in this example, we'll stick with that. We're on the X axis. We've just got our size and square feet. And we've got a number of house prices as well. So the, 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 the X, uh, as you see there, they represent, you know, the intersection of the uh, house prices and the size and square feet. So we plot them out and then we try to come up with a way of uh, drawing a line through that data, which closely matches the supplied data as possible. But you will notice there are going to be outliers, and that's the one of the, another challenge, I guess, for project management folk when they start to maybe work with their um, machine learning engineers or data science teams, you know, there are compromises to, to be made when you look at data. You're looking for uh, the best fit possible. So once we've actually plotted that, we can then, and we've trained our, our machine learning algorithm, and you'll hear that term coming up as well in artificial intelligence and machine learning, where we train our data. So that's where we get all our histor historical data, and we train our model on that data. So we've trained our model and then we come along and say, OK, we're, we've tested that. We think it's pretty accurate. It's not 100 percent, but it's pretty good. So we, we come up with a, a, a new question and we say, I've got a, a, a house here and it's uh, approximately uh, 1800 feet. So using the model, then I can plot that and determine that it should f sell for around uh, 210,000. This is probably not Dublin house prices, which are probably you know going crazy at the moment, but we can see how it, how it, how it applies and how you might work that out. So let's talk about how you might use that then in, in project management. So we're looking to create estimates or predictions on the challenges that we have in project management. So perhaps again, we're looking to uh, predict the Y value, a continuous value, you know, from zero to infinity or whatever that might be. And we can say maybe we can, given the, the right features, the right training data, we can predict, we can predict the duration of a project. We can predict the duration of a task. We can predict the cost uh, of the project um, or the cost of a task. You might even be able to predict how a particular uh, d delay might occur for approvals and how long that delay might be. So that's uh, one example, and that's uh, linear regression. I want to talk about log uh, logistic regression as well. So the classic example people use uh, when they're le uh, uh, learning machine learning is you look at a 
a machine learning model that can uh, predict uh, uh, or look at the tumor cell classification. You know, predict whether a, a tumor uh, or a cell is, is, is uh, cancerous or not, the tumor cell. So, what we're looking to do is we have uh, we map things against, for example, age of patient and the size of tumor. We plot them on a graph and we divide them up and say, in this example, the X items are cancerous and the zero items are not. So then we can, if we introduce a new value, we can say, where does that sit on this graph? Or the, uh, uh, and that will then predict, you know, is it cancerous or not? So with logistic reg regression, you're typically looking for, it's a yes or no answer, but it can be multiple as well. So the output could be yes or no, could be pass or fail, or again, it could be even something like low, medium, or high. Then if we look at examples of uh, how that might be applied to project management, we can look at risk classification. So given we have several parameters or features of a risk, and we have trained our model on historical data, on historical risks uh, on our own project or in projects within the organization. We could then use uh, logistic regression to say, let's uh, do risk classification. So is this a, you know, a low, medium or high risk? We could look at uh, a task delay warning. So we might say, given again, parameters or features of particular tasks, we could say maybe a yes or no. Is there a likelihood that this task will be delayed? Or we might say a risk to issue warning. So again, with the proper amount of uh, historical data and the proper selection of the right features, we could say, is it likely that this risk will turn into an issue? And again, that might be a yes or no answer. And the system uh, uh, could prompt you uh, on that basis. So I wonder, you know, if those examples resonate uh, with you here tonight. Maybe you can pop in the chat whether they do, and you think that might be if, if you had a uh, if a machine learning system could use that for you, would that be something useful? And maybe you can think of other examples as well. So maybe you can pop them in, in the chat, and we can probably have a look at them uh, later on as well. But it'd be really. Uh, keen to hear your feedback on that. Does it? Do these examples resonate with you, or are there other examples for uh, logistic regression? And the first example we look at, the uh, linear regression, do they resonate with you, or is there other examples that you can think of? So, the first two examples that I looked at are also called supervised learning because I talked about this idea of having to produce training data. So you have to give it historical data and you have to label that data, you know, as yes or no, project is successful or not, and feed that into the model. And they're called, uh, that's called supervised learning. So I also wanted to make you aware of another type of uh, machine learning model called uh, unsupervised. An example, um, used in industries where you might uh, you group your customers or your households into clusters to to try and uh, predict their buying behavior you know for marketing purposes so you don't actually determine or know what the clusters are so what you're doing is feeding data into a system and saying essentially you're saying tell me something interesting about this data put this data are these groups into clusters which i can then you know, analyze and find out why are what why are why do we have the X's in a particular group? Why are the triangles in a particular group? What's interesting about them? And what can that tell us, for example, about our, our marketing efforts in that example I talked about? So in project management, how could we use this? So one way we might do it is say, let's get all of our tasks within a project or perhaps across the enterprise, you know, if you've got a, a PMO. 
and let's put them into a clustering algorithm and let's see how they how they group together and find out what's interesting about them. Maybe the algorithm might cluster them together and say, well, these are the tasks that finish on time, or these are the tasks that are delayed, or these are ones that I have a, a risk against. So you'd have to so the, the you'd have to work with the model then to find out you know why it's it's doing that. So it does part of the work for you, you know. It puts them together into interesting groups. So again, you might do that to, to analyze risks or issues. So you might feed your risks or issues into this type of model, and it will cluster them together. And you might be able to determine you know interesting facts about the uh, risks or issues based on the clusters um, that they're allocated to. So I also want to talk about uh, deep learning because that's an artificial neural networks. That's really, uh, I, I guess, uh, the thing that's most in the news at, at the moment. So the model is designed in, to loosely simulate the human brain. Now, it's not trying to replicate the human brain in any way. It's more of a nice uh, analogy, really. Um, but it works uh, on a simplistic level, similar to the way we understand the human brain works. Um, and bearing in mind, you know, it's hard to replicate something like the human brain when we don't actually fully understand it yet. You know, the science is still on ongoing on that. Uh, so we have the basic unit uh, within an artificial uh, neural network is the neuron or the nodes. And they're basically split between different layers. You've got an input layer, you've got a hidden layer or layers, and you'll have typically you'll have more than one one layer. You'll have several, and then you've got an output layer. So these neurons are connected, um, or linked by channels, which are actually assigned uh, uh, weights. And what actually happens is we can feed data through the model going forward. And we get a particular output. And what happens is then once we know what the inputs are and what a particular output is, again, going back to that supervised learning approach where we have uh, labeled data. What an artificial neural network can do is it can start off just by, for example, applying random weights to those connections, totally random, and it will feed the information to, to this neural network. And obviously it'll come up with a wrong answer. But what it does then, it says, well, how wrong is the answer? And my plus or minus, what's the error rate? And then it can start, it will start going back through the network. Correcting those weights within that connect those nodes iteratively. And then going forward again and going, OK, am, am I nearer the correct answer? Am I plus or minus? And then I'll go back and to a process called uh, back propagation, go back to that artificial ne network and keep changing those weights, those numbers um, until it gets it right. Now, it may do this tens of thousands of times, even millions of times to go through that until it gets it right. Um, to train an artificial neural network, it can take hours or I've even heard of it taking months to actually train the network. But once it's trained, it's trained and then it can Conform, uh, can perform the task. Now, artificial neural networks can be used for all of the examples we looked at previously. You could actually use them for classification, regression, and and uh, many other applications. Um, a common application of artificial uh, neural networks is actually facial uh, recognition that uses artificial neural networks to um, recognize uh, uh, faces. Um, and we're actually going to see when I talk about some of the vendors, I'm going to uh, point you to um, one particular vendor who has an artificial network uh, available um, to the general public that you can uh, request to access, which will look at um, predicting uh, the success of a, of a project. So it can be ab absolutely used um, for the project management area. 
so you, 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 the, it begs the question then, when would you use, you know, logistic regression or linear regression or artificial neural network? And there's no simple answer to that. I think that's where the project management folk will need to work closely with their uh, uh, data scientists in the organization or data scientist vendors and come up with that and say, well, what's most appropriate? So how complex is the task? So for something that's, you know, relatively simple, you probably wouldn't apply it to an uh, apply it, uh, to an artificial neural network to solve. But something more complex, maybe it is relevant. And that's where you'd have to have those discussions um, you know, with your data scientists or machine learning uh, engineers about that. So I want to take you through a couple of vendors at the moment. So I guess what we've done previously in those examples, on one level, that's theoretical. But it can be done if you if you can build those models and you have, as I said, a, a data science team within your organization, you can actually go ahead and build those uh, uh, models in house. But there are also vendors out there that are produced systems and soft uh, uh, SaaS systems and that you can subscribe to and use as well that are built on artificial intelligence. And I thought I'd mention just a handful of them here. Now, uh, up front, I don't have any affiliation with any of these uh, uh, entities or companies. I have spoken to some of their uh, founders when I was writing various articles, but there are just uh, some examples or applications which I've kind of found interesting. Um, so Shark Tower is a UK based uh, company and they use uh, machine learning uh, technology for project management. And they use it to analyze data uh, to spot problems before they happen and it can show your project health and your slippage and even look at you know team sentiment as well. Optant is a, an Australian based company and they're heavily focused on at least initially on the sort of large infrastructure uh, projects. Um, but they use AI uh, for predictive analytics you know, to steer your project deliverables and also to show early identification of cost overruns. We also see where NLP or natural language processing um, is an, plays an important role or can play an important role. So there's a company called Assembly AI um, and they've got an AI meeting assistant which will automatically record, transcri transcribe and generate um, meeting notes and summaries. So for example, you might use it for your PMO meetings or your steering committee meetings. Again, that's using that concept of uh, natural language processing. Then we, there's a UK company called Scope Master and they've got an AI driven uh, requirements analyzer. Um, and this is particularly for uh, software projects. So it finds and fix requir requirements issues and um, which uh, they claim will uh, claim and should do uh, save significant uh, rework. Last but not least, we have a, a Stone uh, Meadow uh, Consulting. And this is the example I talked about earlier. So they have a, a, a neural network tool which can be used to predict uh, success or failure of a product. And if you go to their website, you can actually sign up and they give you access to the tool so you can have a, a play around with, with it. Um, and it's a good introduction to how machine learning might work or how you might use it in your organization uh, or on your projects. So there are uh, five example of five vendors um, that are actually now using artificial intelligence in products that you can use, you know, this evening, today or tomorrow, sign up to and use and, and start to explore and, and apply to your projects. So the next thing I want to talk about briefly, briefly is ethics. Um, so this is uh, particularly ethics around big data and ethics in AI is something that's uh, sort of really close to my heart. Um, and I thought tonight if we touched on um, AI and project management, uh, it'd be wrong not to spend at least just a few minutes to talk about uh, some ethics and, and ethical considerations. So uh, somebody once joked that, uh, you know, ethics is a bit like the company dishwasher. You know, everyone is responsible for emptying it and we all benefit from that. Um, but it's the person who actually cares most about it who will end up doing it. So this is true of 
uh, ethics, of course, but it's also really true of AI ethics. So I'm a firm believer that AI is and can be uh, a force for good. So I certainly don't want to paint a dystopian future with some of these quotes, but I do. It's kind of I do want to touch on it for a while. You know, I do think that AI has the potential to help us solve some of the you know existential uh, crises that we face as a species: uh, climate change, biodiversity, and food security. But we need to be mindful of the potential negative side of artificial intelligence, and I think. Everybody needs to be aware of this, but particularly for project managers. Because perhaps at the moment, some of you are already working in, on AI projects, and I think in the coming years, a lot of us, if not most of us, will be working on some type of AI projects. And um, so it's important to be mindful of uh, some of the potential negative impacts of an uh, artificial intelligence and particularly in um, in around uh, algorithms and how pervasive they, they are at the moment. Um, so in, in Cathy O'Neill's uh, book, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction, um, you know, she talks about uh, these algor AI algorithms and, um, you know, whether that's used for a recruitment process or you're going for a loan application, you know, we see that we're being impacted them by them every day. But she points out that the privileged we'll see time and again are processed by people, you know, the masses are processed by machines. So the example she that uh, she gave us, if you're in the US, say if you're going for an entry level job at Walmart, um, you'll probably most definitely be screened by an AI uh, algorithm. Compare that, say, to if you're going for a senior executive position on Wall Street, where you probably get the personal or the human touch. Um, and she talks about being mindful of three aspects of these, you know, uh, weapons of math destruction, as, as she called them, you know, the opacity of it, the scale and uh, the damage. So it's worthwhile when we're thinking about AI. To think about some of those uh, implications, and I think uh, the, the final uh, set of quotes here is from um, uh, Shoshana Zuboff and her, her excellent book um, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Um, where she talks, you know, she's talking about the impact that the likes of Facebook and Google have on all of society. Um, and it's not a Facebook or, or Google, I'm not having a, a bash at them by any by any stretch of the imagination. And um, but it would be fair to say that, you know, big big tech is often you know guilty of using the approach that it's easier to beg, you know, for forgiveness than to ask for permission. So it's just something to bear in mind, I think, as project management professionals in the coming years as we start to be impacted by AI and as we start to implement AI systems into organizations. So let's spend a few minutes and talk about the implications actually for the project management profession. So I guess one of the things that's going to be really important is data literacy for the project management profession. I think as a profession, we're pretty good at data. You know, we're used to capturing risks and issues uh, and creating Gantt charts and creating budgets and monitoring budgets. But data literacy, being able to interpret data and data visualization as well, having those skills to not only gather the data, but present it visually to your your stakeholders, your sponsor, your steering committee. That's going to become really important, especially we have we have more data and ever increasing amount of data. We need to be able to present that. Um, and that's actually why I would think capturing data is going to become more and more important. And the activity of lessons learned exercises during a project and post uh, project are going to be paramount. Now, I know a lot of the project management uh, folk who are on the call today, you know, will probably feel well that's something that we do uh, anyway. But I guess in my experience, sometimes that can fall by the wayside when we're trying to do lessons learned. We don't always get in around to do it or doing it as comprehensively. As we probably would like to do or as we should do. 
So I talked earlier on about supervised learning and the need to train our models. And, uh, you know, putting aside the, the, the potential of synthetic data for the moment, but we can only train uh, on the data that we have and that we've captured. So capturing those lessons learned, documenting them properly, capturing risks and issues in a consistent format on our projects across the enterprise, across the PMO, is going to be so, so important and becoming increasingly important. And that's one of the things that will set you apart as a project manager in the coming years. And I firmly believe that the project management profession is robust and it won't be impacted in the same way or certainly to the same extent as other professions that we've seen. So to ensure that you have longevity in your project management career in the coming years with the advances in artificial intelligence, I think soft skills are going to become really important as well. And that's maybe a piece of advice that I'd give everyone on the call to set yourself apart in the project management profession to ensure that you have longevity. Focus on these skills, on the soft skills. So some of these soft skills that you need to look at, and these are the skills that, at least for the moment, AI cannot replicate. So team building and team development. Let AI do some of the repetitive tasks that you might do, like report generation or spotting risks or issues. And focus on some of these value adding activities like team building development, spending more time talking to and engaging with all of your stakeholders, that relationship building. And creativity. Now that's something, you know, AI may be approaching that, but at least for the short to medium term, that's a skill that sets us apart. And these are some of these uh, innate qualities that make us all, you know, human. So problem solving, you know, it goes hand in hand with creativity. So AI can solve problems, but you have to provide it with, you know, labeled data. It's not able to be creative. You have to tell it what does good look like, and then it can figure figure out a, a model behind that. But it can't. It's it's at least for the moment it can't do problem uh, solving in a creative sense. Coaching as well. So that's what can set you apart as a project manager in this coming age of AI. So a AI, certainly again at the moment and the foreseeable future, it can't really do coaching properly. So you can spend time uh, developing your team and building up those skills as a coach. So that projects and employers, you know, know that you're the person to go to and who will look to and develop their team when you lead a, a project. So as we get towards the end of the session, I'm going to leave you with some uh, uh, recommended reading. So I talk about uh, Cathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Math Destruction, and uh, Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Age of uh, Surveillance Capitalism. Um, and Paul Boudreau has a great book, Applying Artificial Intelligence to Project Management. Um, and Paul is the person who created that the, the, the AI tool from Stone Meadow Consulting, which I talked about that you can have uh, applied to have access to. Um, I'm going to give a shameless plug, plug for my own book here, which is called uh, Humology, How to Put Humans Back at the Heart of Technology. And that's a book that was just released in, in, in the last few months. And that touch on, touches on uh, uh, subjects like uh, ethics as well. Um, you've got AI and the project manager um, from Peter Taylor and a really interesting book by uh, Bernard Marr, who's one of the thought leaders uh, in artificial intelligence and um, called uh, Artificial Intelligence in Practice. Uh, also, I guess Bernard is quite a good person to follow on LinkedIn um, or Twitter. He does. He puts a lot of interesting stuff out there around uh, how, how AI is being used um, within industry. Um, 
so we get towards the end of my presentation, and I think I may have gone it too, too quickly, but at least that means we have plenty of time for some questions or discussions. So I'm going to pass it back to um, uh, uh, Paramita and the PMI team uh, now to take us through uh, the next steps and some of the questions. Yeah, yes. Sure. Thank you, Declan, so much for the inspiring presentation. It's really interesting to see how artificial intelligence and the machine learning algorithms of the supervised and supervised learning could be applied to drive project management task automation uh, and how these could disrupt the project management profession. Um, it also great that, that we know that the soft skills is what can set you as a project manager apart in this area uh, for the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. So. Uh, I'm opening for questions now, and there is some questions in the chat. So let's start by a question from Dan uh, about the practicality of the AI and the machine learning in project management. So the question is, how practical is it? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question and an interesting one. I think it's evolving. So I would say that uh, I touched on the need to have um, historical data to train your algorithms and that's kind of the missing piece at the moment so and it is pretty much impossible to develop them in-house without having that historical training data so that that's the gap at the moment which probably makes for most people makes it uh, makes it not practical to develop them in-house but perhaps you can use some of those uh, uh, commercially available products so I think my, my, my honest answer would be it's not very practical at this moment for people to do it in house unless they've got lots of historical data. And, you know, it, it's my experience that you don't have that yet, you know. Yeah, fair answer. Next question from Santosh about are there any rules or guidance defined to govern the artificial intelligence ethics? Uh, well, I, th I think there, there, uh, there are emerging rules. So you'll see actually that uh, the European Union and the United Nations have now uh, put forward uh, legislation which covers uh, ethics and artificial intelligence. And it's, it's, it's a growing subject. People are aware that uh, it's really important. So there's guidance out there, um, legislative guidance out there uh, around uh, ethics and artificial intelligence. And then I just think, uh, you'll see more and more and I've started to see it already with organizations that work in technology that are putting forward their own guidelines around how they'll use, uh, uh, how they'll treat ethics and artificial intelligence. And you can see Google have done that recently as well. And um, so there's the, the legislative aspect and then there's the aspect of big tech, you know, like I think stepping up to the plate and saying this is a big deal, this is an issue, we're going to be proactive and put forward our advice for ethics and AI. Yeah, there is another question related to the accountability and the responsibility for uh, such artificial intelligence model. So if there is a problem or an error, so who will be responsible? Is it the AI or the person or the organization uh, that is using the artificial intelligence? Oh, that's a really interesting question and that's part of that uh, evolving I guess legislation that's coming forward about who who is responsible you know you might look at a, a self-driving car and what happens and there have been accidents with that what happens if there's an accident with a self-driving car who's responsible you know is it uh, is it the person who built the algorithm is it the person who built um, the sensors that are on the car is it the person who you know built the car um, uh, it's there's no real answer to that and I think that's something though that people who work in uh, project management and particularly if you're you know developing an artificial intelligence system think about that as well so think about ethics you know spend time and allocate that uh, allocate some time to think about the ethics put it in your project plan think about responsibility as well so who's accountable and who's responsibility for uh, the results of, of that uh, algorithm other things to consider as well as, you know, post go live, who's going to update that algorithm? Because they're usually right at a, a point or a moment in time. But once you put it out there, you're getting more data and more information and the context changes. So who's going to update the, the algorithm to make sure it's still relevant 
to make sure it's still ethical, make sure it's still practical. These are some things to think about as well for project management folk. OK. Thank you, Declan. Uh, another interesting question about the uh, information security and cyber security. So what is your point of view on incorporating artificial intelligence in the future information security or cyber security projects? Um, I think cyber security is kind of well out of my comfort zone <laughs> and it's not something that I, I know too much about, but I know that artificial intelligence will play a central role in, in those projects going forward. And indeed, indeed it has to, you know, because they are so complex and we need all the all the tools that we that we can to help beat uh, cybersecurity. And there is another question uh, which is not clear for me. What is the setup complexity effort cost infrastructure requirement? So can you clarify more about it, Badrij? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, so I mean that that that's really a question as I talked about, particularly if you're if you're going to embark on this journey of implementing uh, artificial intelligence, you can't do it on, on your own as a project manager. Your role is to to manage the project. You've got to engage with your machine learning engineers, your data scientists, and your hardware and, and your hardware folks as well. And um, so there are implications. There are absolutely um critical implications for hardware when you embark on these projects. So we talked about, you know, the artificial neural networks. So, you know, um, when I was studying um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and building simple programs uh, like linear regression, logistic regressions, and I stress simple because I'm not a technical person, I could do it on my laptop and you could run very simple programs on your laptop. But if you're trying to build an artificial neural network, you can't really do that, you know, certainly on your laptop and probably even on a, a standard uh, small company's infrastructure. So you've got to have that uh, infrastructure and graphical processing units, etc. And so it's a key consideration and it's probably something that I can't you know, answer comprehensively, but it's certainly a key consideration for project managers embarking on any AI projects. OK, thank you, Declan. Um, another question related to the practicality of the machine learning algorithms and, and the specific for the resource management. So the question is, uh, I wonder if you have any practical example for how to use artificial intelligence to facilitate resource management. Um, I, th I think it can be used. It's not something that I've done myself or built any systems that actually do that. But I think you'll see increasingly, for example, in some of the, uh, the commercially uh, available tools that are that I, I pointed out. Some of them will have some resource allocation features, but it's probably something that we'll see more of in the coming years. So again, I haven't built that myself, um, and I can't say there's a, uh, a, an immediate application of that, but something we'll probably see more of in the coming years. So again, it might be you could you could see where you could build an application which would say, given again, given that you have enough historical data, let's look at the task allocation for a project and see who might be over allocated based on historical data, based on the maybe based on the uh, uh, the tasks that, that that's allocated to a particular resource, based on whether similar tasks on similar projects have been, you know, uh, uh, have finished on time or behind time, etc. So you could certainly build the model, but I haven't seen one uh, uh, built yet. OK, uh, we have another question related to uh, uh, as we have projects, each project by definition is unique. So how does previous project data belay any part in artificial intelligence without major minor tweaking for each new project? That's a really good point. So you need to have, first of all, relevant data. So for example, and, and that's uh, and I pointed out, that's a challenge for organizations at the moment, um, and it may be addressed in coming years with synthetic data, but essentially, you know, if, you, if you've got a project which is a software develop, development project, you can't really take historical data, say from an infrastructure project or a construction project, you know, and apply that simply because it just, it just won't work. So you need to have relevant data, uh, first of all, then you also need to, to fine tune the model. So again, that's what something the project manager would do with uh, machine learning engineers and data scientists. So you'd fine tune the model. You'd say, 
you know, it's never going to be right the first time. You look at what's the right parameters? What gives us the best results? How do we fine tune this? So it's 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 a comprehensive exercise. And I guess what I've tried to show tonight is that on one level, these things are very simple to understand, but to implement them properly and to get true value out of them, you know, takes time, takes effort, takes dedication. Great. Uh, we have another question related to the artificial intelligence suppliers that you are providing in the slide. So the question is, which might be a good point of contact for capturing lessons learned? Um, so you can look at, I would say, uh, something like uh, assembly AI, for example, as well as capturing you know, speech to text can also you look at written text as well and generate that. So it might be you look at the uh, natural language processing and look at the documents that you produce for lessons learned and produce them into models, you know, look for relevant features, etc. Um, and I would say probably uh, I would look at shark terror as well to see how that might, how they might be able to apply the lessons learned there uh, and, and use their models to predict, um, you know, project slippage and uh, uh, project health and team sentiment as well. So I'd probably two I'd point out is uh, assembly AI for natural language processing and then maybe Shark Tower as well for machine learning. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you so much, Declan, for this great presentation. You're very um, welcome. Thank Thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, Santosh, can can you provide the slide related to the PDUs? Great. So thanks all for attending this live webinar. You, we, we will be auto reporting one video for you if you are a member of the BMI Ireland chapter, and you can also self report the video using the claim code provided in the slide with 0.5 in business and 0.5 in the power skills. Um, I'd like to thank you all again for this great presentation and uh, great comments and have a nice night. Three minutes back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks all.